Hello everyone. So today we will look at how to solve a program with a computer. This is like there are many basic programmers who are first time programmers who probably know the syntax of a programming language but are always challenged as to how to do a program. So this section is for them. Right. So typically right when you look at a program uh, you wonder how others are doing it. How many variables should I define for this particular program? What should be the data type? How many conditional statements should I use? Should I use if, while, switch? What is that I need to use? Do I need loops for a particular program? What are the flags? What are the counters which are required? These are some of the basic questions that anyone has who is very new to programming. So for a beginner, always it's like how to come up with a program. I probably know a little bit of syntax, but I don't know how to come up with a program. That's the biggest problem anyone has. Probably when you look at someone else's program, you might be able to say, hey, how did he really come up with that? How could I not come up with it? There are so many, so many things, so many possibilities. How to decide when to use a while loop? How to decide when to use a for loop? This is a big, big problem that any new beginner has, right? So when you look at someone else's program, right? You're frustrated. How did he or she do that? That's the biggest one. And probably after looking at the code, you might be able to understand. In some cases, even after that, you might not be able to understand. This is the problem for every new beginning programmer, right? Or the first time coder. So now, always tell the new programmers, do not worry. Do not stop trying. Always keep trying till you succeed. That's the key for any programmer, right? So now, here in this section, for the first time programmers, we are going to talk about how do you approach programming? How do you solve a program with a computer, right? So I've been doing programming for almost 25 years now, and I've been teaching programming for close to five years. I have seen students in very close quarters as to where they have been struggling with programming. And once that aha moment comes in, then it becomes very easy for them. After that, they're on their own. We just need to give the next level of challenge. But first thing is, how to crack the first set of programs, how to do that, right? That's the most interesting part and that's what we are going to solve it here. So how we are going to do our approach to teach programming, right? In this video, what are we going to see? We are going to solve a few programs which are going to be in increasing order of complexity. Probably the first two programs you might already know, but the key is let's go through the process, right? So I am going to explain my thinking process, thinking aloud when I look at the program and try to solve it, right? So that you are getting into the same frame of mind, how to think, how to approach a program. That's what is going to be the focus. Third is we are going to discuss about alternate approaches, not probably for the simple programs. Once we get into slightly more trickier programs, we are going to look at, hey, is this, we are going to use a for loop. Do we do a if, do we have to do a for within a if? What is the approach of uh, this for this particular program? What are the pros and cons? We are going to discuss that. So finally, we are going to take one small step at a time in logical program solving, right? So to build that thinking capability of how to do programming, we are going to take smaller steps rather than jumping. We are going to focus on the logic building part. So I'm not going to focus more on the syntax, right? I, my assumption is at least the basic syntax you need to know. And finally, we are going to use an X-ray tool. I'll explain that as well to look into the program. We are going to inspect the program while it is running to see how it is running, right? And what is happening to the variables? We are going to do an X-ray into that code. So that's going to be really interesting for you and you all will be able to do the same. Let's dive in. So some ground rules, right? While we are doing this, we will use C programming as the base language because many beginners start with that. But if you're starting with Python or if you're starting with Java, it doesn't matter, right? So your logic would be the same. Only thing is the syntax might be slightly different in the other language. Otherwise, whatever you have in C, the syntax, the same for loop, the same while, the same if, all these are very similar, right? Only a semicolon might be missing, a tab might be um, need to be there here or there. That's the only difference between the languages. But how you approach the thinking, how do you approach the program remains the same irrespective of the language. So my assumption, as I said earlier, you will know the basic syntax, right? I'm not planning to teach the syntax. Um, so you can go through my other videos to learn the syntax. So 
my assumption is you have a computer with the internet or you have an IDE which is a compiler installed in your local system so that you can try them out in parallel. After you each program, right after I explain the logic, my assumption is you will shut down the system and you will try it on your own. So the slow thinking process is continuously happening. No rote learning. That is, I don't want anyone mugging up the code. I don't want you to look at the entire, entire, entire. Don't go like that. So make sure that you are thinking about the program. You're working through the solution like the way we will do in this course. Finally. Don't worry about any programming language, right? So you will learn programming step by step here. But so don't worry, right? Will I get the program? Will I be able to solve programming? First thing you need to have is the confidence to say that yes, within a week's time, I'll be a really good programmer. That's what is critical. Practice daily some of these programs. I am sure right by the end of the video, when you come to that, definitely you would be a really good programmer and you will be able to solve real good programs. Now, first what we'll do is we'll take a program, right? So this is how we are going to discuss. This is the first program. It's a very simple program. Add two numbers and print the result. Very, very simple thing. Now you might already know how to solve this. You might have even typed the code. Uh, you might be able to do it now. But first is stay with me. What we are going to do is we are going to take um, how we think through the process, right? We'll start with this program and we'll go through the thinking process. And when this thinking process is applied over and over, even complex programs can be easily solved. So first is let's understand what is given here, right? So we have to add two numbers and print the result. Now input is given as three, four and output is seven. This is a sample, right? This is the input that's going to be given to the program to see if your program is working fine. So this is the test case one. So for this particular program, when you have written the program, I'm going to give three and four as the two inputs. So the output should be seven. Second test case, when I run the program again, I'll give eight and nine and I should see a 17. So this is the expectation, right? So you can pause the video and think about your program or I'm going to discuss the solution. Let's go through the thinking process, right? So I'm going to use online GDB for programming. So you can use the same or if you have a IDE installed, a Turbo C or any other language, right? You have an IDE installed. So you can use that and start writing your programs. So let's dive in now and see how to go about the thinking process. So I'm going to use this online GDB.com extensively for programming. The other one we'll be using is PythonTutor.com. These are the two websites I'm going to use for my programming. So if you type online GDB, you will get a screen, right? So where the compiler will look like this. All you have to do is select the language as C or Python or Java or C++, whichever you want to use. And this is the IDE we are talking about. So let me type the program, right? Every C program starts with this. This is the standard input output. The header files are included so that you can use printf and scanf. And this is the main syntax. Now the program that we are going to write is adding two numbers, right? So add two numbers and print the result. That's the program we are going to write. So simple. So it says it is two numbers, right? So we know that it is number. So number can be 33.4. It could be 44.3. But clearly in our examples that was given in the program, it said whole numbers, right? It said three, four, it said uh, eight, nine. These were the numbers given which are whole numbers, positive and negative numbers. These are integers. So I'm going to declare two integers because it said you're going to add two numbers, right? So I'm going to declare two integers. Now, one way to do it is, okay, it said I want to add three and four. So I'm going to say a equal to three, a equal to four or a equal to three, b equal to four. So two variables, I have initialized the variables and then I'm saying add the total right so you're going to add the two numbers and store the total so now we'll go back i need some variable where i'm going to store the total so sum is equal to a plus b because we are adding the two numbers and i'm going to print the result printf total is percentage d okay sum if i give this this is gonna work now if you look at it if i run the program it's saying total is seven this program seems correct, but there is a problem here, right? So what did the question say? The question said that. So the question said input is two numbers. That means 
it's expecting the program to read two numbers right but what we have done we have directly initialized two numbers so our output 7 seems correct but test case 2 output expected is 17 but it never read the 8 and 9 so that's the problem right so let's get back to our pro so the problem we have done is we have hard coded the values hard coding this is one of the major problems i see with beginners where they see that hey the answer is 7 so I need to get the answer as 7, right? If you do this, probably for one test case, it will pass, right? But it will not be able to really work for different inputs. So the thing you need to do is you should not be hard coding the values. So this is not the way to do, but you have to read the two values from user. So that you do a scan of percentage D, percentage D, ampersand A, ampersand B. So beginners, I've seen some problems, right? So they'll forget the ampersand symbol. That's one of the problems I have seen. So this is I am reading the two numbers and then I am adding the two numbers storing the value in sum. Right. So now if you look at this, it's waiting for the input. So I'll enter four and three. Yes, total is seven. I'll run it again. Now I'll give eight and nine. It gives 17. So your program is working fine. So let's go through the thinking process that we did again. So first is in the input, it said two numbers are going to be given and it was all whole numbers. So what we did is we defined two integers A and B and then we had to calculate the total. So I've created another variable called sum and then scan of percentage D, uh, percentage D A and B. That means I'm reading the two values. I'm storing it in that sum. I'm printing the value, right? very very simple program in this program all i wanted to demonstrate is two things number one you need you should not be hard coding you should read the values from the user so look at the test cases right so the different test cases are you're running once you're running the second time you're giving two different inputs and you're getting the required output so first is never hard code a value as answer in the program you should read, calculate the value and display the output. That's the first thing. Second thing that we had looked at is you have to, how do you declare the variables? What are the data types which are required? That depends on the input that was given. So these are the two main points I want you to look at from this program. Let's look at the second program now and we'll take it from there. So in this program, the second program is find the greatest of three given numbers right so if three four and five are given output should be five if six four and three are given output should be six if four five and three are given output should be five three three and three are given output should be three so this is the program right so again not a very complex one it's a very simple program but let's understand the program right as to how to do this so you see that there are three inputs which are given. So you need three integers to start with A, B and C, which are going to take these values. Again, you should not be hard coding the values. You cannot say A is three, B is four, C is five. Instead, you should use scanf to read the three values. After you have read it, then comes the main logic. So let's think about that logic once we get there. So let's get on to online GDB and first start reading the three values. So we are back to online GDB. So I'm going to type int main. So this is the program. This is a program which is going to find the greatest of three given numbers. That's the program we are talking about here. So I'm having this int main open bracket, close bracket. So I need three variables as we discussed A, B, C. All three are integers. First thing is we have to read the three values. So I'm going to do a scan of percentage D, percentage D, percentage D, ampersand A, ampersand B, ampersand C, right? So I have read the three values from the user, right? If you want to give a hint to the user, you can give a printf statement here saying enter the three numbers so that when you run the program, the user will know that, hey, otherwise it will be just blank, right? Instead, it's going to prompt enter the three numbers and you can enter the three numbers. Now that we have got the three numbers, right? What is the next step? So if you look at it, we have to compare the numbers. Is first number greater than the second number? Is the first number greater than the third number? So when you look at three numbers, right? When do you say that a number is bigger than another number? When you compare it and find that the first number is greater than second number, then you will say first number is bigger. 
If second number is greater than the first number, you will say second number is bigger, right? So what we'll do is we'll say, we'll check first this first condition, right? Is A greater than B? That means is the first number greater than second number? I'm doing a open bracket, close bracket. So if this is the case, we know that A is greater than B. Now what do we have to say? So assume that A is greater than B. That is the first input that is given is greater than the second input. So now what we have to check? We have to check if the first is greater than the third as well. So I'm going to check if A is greater than C. So if this is the case, we can say that A is biggest. Okay. Percentage E is greatest and we can say A. So this is the first thing. So now we are checking A is greater than B and A is greater than C. What if A is greater than B? That is the first input is greater than the second number, but first input is not greater than the third number. So if that is the case, we'll have to say else printf percentage D is greatest and we have to say C. So what is happening here? So A is greater than B, right? That is a certain. So if A is greater than B, then we have to compare A and C, correct? Because A is greater than B. Now A is greater. So we have to compare A and C. If A is greater than C as well, then A is greatest or C is greater. Simple. So let's run this program. So it's asking for the three numbers. I'm saying five, four, three. So five is going to get assigned to A. B is going to have the value four. C is going to have the value three. Now let's run this you see that five is greatest. It's working correctly. So is my program correct? Is this absolutely correct? So let's test it, right? So I'm going to check with another set of input. Now I'm going to say three, four, and five. So three, four, and five, right? So if A is greater than B, so it is going to check is A, which is having a value of three, B is having a value of four. Is A greater than B? No, it is not greater than B. That means it will not get into the if at all and nothing will get printed because if this fails, if A is not greater than B, which is the condition here, A is less than B, it will come here, right? So that means there is nothing we have given here. So no output is going to come. So many programmers, first time programmers have a question. See, I wrote the same program, but I didn't know what are the other conditions required. So now let's get here right to this particular page. So when you look at it, the first test case is there three, four, five. The answer should have been five. If you look at it, it is checking three and four, which we call the first input as A, second input as B, third input as C. So when C is bigger, we know that our program is handling it. So if you look at test case two, right? Six, four and three, where A is bigger than B and C. So in this particular case, uh, we need to have a condition there, right? Which will handle that. Third test case, if you see four, five and three, where B is the greatest one. If you look at it, this is a logic which we have not incorporated. So we have checked A is greater than B, but what happens when A is less than B? So we have not handled that condition. So this is how when you do the programming, you need to think about what is that are we satisfying first all the test cases which are given in the program. First thing is that. Second thing is we need to look at if only one test case was given, we need to now look at it. Okay, instead of 3, 4 and 5 being the inputs, what will happen if it is 4, 5 and 3? What will happen if it is 5, 4 and 3? What will happen if it is 5, 5 and 5? Right? So we need to think about these combinations. So when A is the biggest one, what will happen? When B is the biggest one, what will happen? When C is the biggest one, what will happen? This is our program handling all the three cases. So this is how you make sure that the program is handling all the logic, right? So now let's go, get back to the program. We will look at how to handle when A is the greatest one, when B is the greatest one, and when C is the greatest one. So let's open our online GDB now. So we'll take the else case here. So else means A is less than or equal to B, right? Because if is handling the case where A is greater than B. So again here, you need to check 
so here it means that b is greater than a right so that's what it means so we'll check if b is greater than c that's the next condition so we'll say percentage d is greatest and it will say b else printf percentage d is greatest we'll give the value as c so if you look at it this is a complete one where you have a b and c all three cases are covered so i'll select c again so we'll give the three numbers first i'll give three four five so c is the greatest one here a is three b is four c is five so it should say c is greatest right so yeah five is greatest now correct so next actually we'll say where a is the greatest one and b and c are lesser than that right so now it should say 5 is greatest yes let's look at the third one where i'll have c as the greatest 10 20 30 it should say 30 is the greatest so if you see all the three conditions are working and we'll take the case where all the three are same it should say 10 is greatest yes so our program is working fine so this is how you derive it so quick summary from this so we had this program where we had to find the greatest of three numbers so we got the three numbers because there was three inputs given in the program. After that, we compared the first A and B and uh, we compared those two. And then we said A is greatest, right? So which if A is greater than B, then we checked if A is greater than C. We said A is greater. If A is greater than B, but A is less than C, then we said C is greater. Similarly, when A is greater than B is false, then we went to the else part and we had the conditions covered there. So primarily we said we'll go back to the test cases to see what are all the conditions to be handled. Are we handling all those conditions? So that's the first thing we checked. Second thing we checked is we went through our uh, similarly uh, we looked at okay hey if the question does not give additional test cases can we create right so can we create the alternate test cases and we'll handle all the cases which are required. So as and when you get more experience with programming, you will be able to think about a lot of test cases. So and then handle those test cases in your program, right? So the ability to think about all the scenarios is what is very important. In most of the interviews or whenever you're doing programs, many hidden test cases will be there. So I showed you in the PPT, all the test cases are as open ones. But in many cases, these would be hidden test cases. So it would be difficult for you to find out what could be the one so that's where you need to think about what could be the other alternatives here right so we'll take another approach here as well this will also work if a is greater than b and a is greater than c so if we check this both the conditions can be checked at one shot itself this is also fine we can say that if this condition is true i'm just showing you an another way to solve the same program right so this is in the second way to do it. Same program. If A is greater than B and A is greater than C. Similarly, else if we'll check it. If B is greater than A and B is greater than C. So whichever is the easiest way, right? You look at both the conditions. We have approached the same problem and we have given two cases here. Then we can say that B is the greatest else we'll say printf percentage d is greatest and we'll say see we don't need any of this this is the other way to solve the same problem that we did earlier so we are checking both the conditions at the same time instead of two different if statements if a is greater than b and a is greater than c then we'll say a is greatest if b is greater than a and b is greater than c then we'll say b is greatest c is greater than or if these two conditions are failing it naturally means c is the greatest one remember this else if will come if this fails then it will come here it will check this condition if this fails then it will come here and print this condition you can test this program as well so we will enter 3 4 5 yes 5 is greatest 3 5 4 again it will say 5 is greatest we'll say where the cases a is the greatest one so i'll give it as 30 20 10 where a is greatest it's saying 30 is greatest so in all the cases the program is working fine so this is an alternate approach earlier we had one if within one if 
you can combine the conditions as well. So I'm just giving you another perspective to solve the same problem. It is not like this is better or that is better. You can look at this condition as well. Whichever is easier for you, you can take it. But in any case, you have given been given two different options. So any program might have multiple solutions. You can actually, you should start looking at alternate solutions so that you can find out which is the way, right? So how we can build additional uh, programming logic. So that's the idea behind it. So let's get on with the next program now. So let's look at the third program. A program to print from given number to one, skipping two numbers, right? So input is, so even if you don't understand the program from the description, if you usually look at the sample test cases given, you will easily understand the program. So let's take the sample test case that they have given, seven, so we need to have one integer, right away you just look at the program as well. So we need to have one integer, whatever we call that variable name say n and we need to read that using a scan of. So that's clear from the test case, right? There is one input that's being given and what are they doing? 7, 5, 3, 1. So if you see there are four numbers to be printed and if at all the given number is 8, which is an even number, they are saying 8, 6, 4, 2, right? No zero because the given number they have said is skipping up to 1. So from this program, right? So if you look at it, if at all they had given it as 100, then we need to do 100, 98, 96, 94. So right away, look at it as whenever it repeats, if it repeats a pattern, it means it involves a loop. Very simple, simple logic, it involves a loop. So let's get on with the program to see how to solve it. So I'll open online GDB as usual and we'll start from there. So we need one number which we are going to get as input scan of percentage d ampersand n right so or we can have a printf as well to say enter the number so it's easier for us to type that so now we have received that number so what it means we have to start with this number right so we'll take a for loop you can choose for loop or while loop i would suggest using for loop beginners use for loop because you will not forget to initialize you will not forget the exist exit condition you will not forget to increment or decrement, right? So that's why I would suggest this. So let's get with this. What did they say? The initial number starts with n. So we'll have a variable int i equal to n because they said the starting number is starting from n. That is if you are giving 7, the first thing that needs to get printed is 7 and it is counting downwards. What did it say? the number is greater than or equal to 1. So while it is greater than or equal to 1. So that's the second one. Third thing, it said it is decrementing by 2. So i is equal to i minus 2. This is the decrement function. Now they said print i. That's it, right? So print f percentage d i. That's all it is, right? So again, we will look at the program. How did we arrive at it? I'll run this program to see if it is working fine. So I'm giving a number, say 10. Yes, so I need to give a space here so that between the numbers you can see the difference. So 10. So 10 means 10, 8, 6, 4, 2. And if I give 7, so I should put print 7, 5, 3, 1. Right, so let's see that. Enter 7, 5, 3, 1. Fine, so how did we arrive at this logic? How did we know that it needs to have a for loop? How did we know that it has to start with n? So let's relook at this again. So first thing is whenever you see that it has to repeat. So the number of printfs is dependent on the n given. It means there is a loop. Whenever there is a repeating thing. So 100 means it has to print 50 numbers, right? If it is 10, it has to print 5 numbers. If it is 7, it has to print 4 numbers, 7, 5, 3, 1. So the number of repetition changes based on the input given. Always remember you need to use a loop. Now in this loop, whatever is that you have given, how did we decide that? So first is i is equal to n. n means if you look at it, 7 is given. It's starting with 7. The output should start with 7. That's why whatever is the input received, I am storing it in i. Second, what are we doing? When i is greater than or equal to 1. Because what did they tell in the program? Print up to 1. Don't print less than that. So if you give less than 1, then it means the condition will be false immediately. Because 
7 is not less than 1. So immediately it will not even enter the loop. If you run this program, if I give 7, it will not even get into the loop. Nothing will get printed. So while the condition is true only, the loop is going to continue. What do they say? While that 7 reduces and it is still greater than 1 or greater than or equal to 1, you run the loop. And how did how much did they say you have to decrement every time? You have to decrement by 2. Right? So every time by 2. So don't do this. This is wrong. I have seen many, many users do this mistake. You have to assign the value. Why students get that thing is because we do plus plus i. Right? So here always you see plus plus i or minus minus i. What does i plus plus mean? It is i is equal to i plus 1. That's what is i plus plus or plus plus i means. Here we are saying i is equal to i minus 2. So it reduces by 2 every time. So 7 becomes 5, 5 becomes 3, 3 becomes 1. And after 1 it becomes minus 1. So we stop it. We don't run the loop again. So that's why it works like this. So you can run it 7. The loop runs 4 times and you get 7, 5, 3, 1. So this is the third program that we have solved. So this is one more logic. So loop is something I have seen that students struggle a bit initially. But remember, for loop is always easy. You have an initialization statement which is this. This executes only once. This executes every time. This executes every time. Remember these three points. So first it will do this once. And then it will check this condition. If this condition is true, then it will execute this statement. After that, it will reduce by 2. This is the logic in which for operates. Right? So don't forget this. Even if you don't know while loop, it is totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. Just remember for loop. Right? So it's more than sufficient. So you don't need to learn all the loops. If you are comfortable with for loop, follow the for loop. Don't worry about going to a while loop at all. So now, Hope this gave an introduction to programming, right? We'll solve many more programs in this series. First, I want you to introduce the way it is being done. Now, we will do the X-ray part with Python Tutor for the upcoming a little more complex programs, right? These are very simple programs that you can easily understand. That's why I didn't get into the X-ray technique of getting into Python Tutor to do a step-by-step -step as to how it works. But we look at those programs in a very short time. Hopefully, such programming exercises, right? How I am thinking the entire process, I want you to understand in parallel. That way, you will understand the programming better. Hopefully, this session was useful. We will continue the series, right? So, I will add more questions to this entire thing. Hopefully, you will be able to learn programming a little bit more better. Thank you.